Hello again. This is uh, another episode, installment show called In Conservation With. I'm David Lindo, also known as Ian Birder. And In Conservation With is all about talking with some of the movers and shakers within the world of conservation. They could be writers, they could be scientists, they can be lay people, doesn't matter. They all have a story to talk about and I'm here to ask questions and to learn more along with you guys. And if you're watching this in the future, please like and subscribe, tell all your mates and get everyone looking at the vast catalogue of uh, information we have there on the Urban Bird of World YouTube play page and in conservation with in particular. Okay, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce my guest to you, who goes by the name of Darren Naish. And Darren and I have, uh, you know what, Darren? Firstly, how are you and where are you? <laughs> Thanks very much, Dave. Oh, I'm, I'm all right. Yeah, uh, busy end of a busy work day. I'm in Southampton, Southern England. Okay, and you're well, yeah? You're good? As well as can be expected in these times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm good. Have we actually physically met? Because I've known you for some year, number of years, now, certainly since um, um, lockdown. And I've been involved in a couple of the things that you do, which you'll tell us about shortly. Um, but have we actually met physically? Very kindly, you gave a talk at one of my TetsuCon events at the London Wetland Centre in, I'm going to say, something like 2015, 2016 you spoke about well it, it was your general backstory about your adventures in uh, ornithology and uh i remember you talk about uh a car that you bought off yuri geller or something <laughs> so so yes we have met and i've got a signed copy of your book as well no it's all coming back to me now i give so many talks i often forget what we're doing here anyway listen um for those who don't know about darren um he is an author he is a paleozoologist who works on dinosaurs, ancient sea reptiles and flying pterosaurs. Uh, he received his PhD in paleontology from the University of Portsmouth in 2006. He has published many books, most recently Ancient Sea Reptiles, which was published by the Natural History Museum and uh, the Smithsonian uh, Books. Uh, the Mesozoic Art uh, with Steve White, and he blogs for the Tetrapod Zoology, which is Tet Zoo, which is uh, what he just talked about just then, where he writes about all manner of zoological topics. Um, he's academically interested in the study of mystery animals, conservation biology and vertebrate uh, evolution in general, and has published articles and books on these subjects. He works for the BBC Natural History Unit and is a chief scientific consultant for Apple TV+. Plus. Uh, for the Apple TV Plus series, Prehistoric Planet. Now, Darren's here tonight, or today, or this afternoon, uh, to talk about cryptozoology, which is a subject that's fascinated me since I was a kid. I mean, I was telling Darren before that if I wasn't a bird, I'd be a cryptozoologist. I love the idea of these animals, potential animals around the world that haven't been discovered yet, that have created some of them have got an amazing kind of myth and, and even an industry behind them like the Loch Ness Monster whereas others have actually come to light and have been discovered and there's some obviously which are complete baloney um, so it'd be great to talk with you about some of that stuff tonight because um, I just I haven't really met anyone I could talk to about this I've been sort of harboring this on my own for a long time. <laughs> yeah, closet, closet cryptozoologist. Yeah, absolutely. So firstly, let's when you were a small child, um, did you have this innate interest or was it something that you kind of fell into? Um the short answer is yes. I mean to to me, um cryptozoology and and all that it entails, I've never been like specifically dedicated to it and sort of like you know that's my lone calling it's for me one of like three or four things that have always gone in parallel so you know as as a young kid I was always interested in prehistoric animals artwork depicting them imagining how they might have lived also super interested in 
you know, what I consider to be like exotic animals, you know, what I consider as a child, zoo animals and farm animals and pets. And um, yeah, uh, cryptozoology was was always part of that. It was like, I, I, I don't know where, I, where I'm going to end up as an adult. If I end up studying fossil animals or, or exotic animals in far from places away from the UK or, or, you know, these mystery animals, cryptozoological animals, I'll be happy either way. But uh, having an interest in all of them at the same time because they're, they're all connected and something that i've written about quite a lot is cryptozoologists the people who've written about these mystery animals they've often couched their explanations for those creatures in the terms of like could they be living fossils could they be like you know animals that we know from the fossil record that have survived to the present that's a mainstay of the cryptozoological literature that's that's really common but and you can understand, well, wait a minute, if if that's the like argument that you're making, well, then you also need to be a bit of an expert on fossil animals. And cryptozoologists often aren't because they often come in from a different angle. So I remember even as a even as a very young person, even a teenager, thinking that wait a minute, it's actually good to be qualified in, you know, paleontology, knowledge of extinct animals. And t t if you want to apply that to cryptozoology and vice versa, if you're interested in, you know, extinct animals, it's also useful to know. Well, there's also this um th there's this like sort of parallel interest in the idea these animals are alive i mean as someone who wrote you, you mentioned my book ancient sea reptiles that's about these animals that we know of you know from fossils that went extinct 66 million years ago to most people to most members of the public their first interaction with fossil seagoing reptiles is things like the loch ness monster and paleontologists tend to be a little bit annoyed or frustrated by that so oh, come on don't talk about that but it's like wait a minute that is the first interface for lots of people so if you're going to entertain or educate the public when you know in talking about fossil marine reptiles you often have to start out by saying you've heard about the Loch Ness Monster this is this is the actual you know, truth of the matter when it comes to Loch Ness Monster you see so I, I think I think they're all connected and I feel that way even more strongly uh, today than I ever have. So the Loch Ness Monster is a gateway species or crypto species to get people involved what yeah. is the actual definition by your view of a of cryptozoology what is it yeah cryptozoology is um the study of alleged creatures that some people have argued exist they that exist in the physical world they're real undiscovered animals they're out there and at the moment we only know of them we as in people that practice science uh, and we are typically talking about people from the uh, European tradition of academic science. We only know about them through anecdote and stories. So the argument is that the, these creatures might be known to our species. They might be known to humanity as a whole, because you could be talking to, you know, um, people in some, from a European perspective, you know, exotic, obscure part of the world. Those people claim to know of this creature, but to science, it's not yet recognised. So you can understand that for things like you know, Bigfoot, Yeti, Loch Ness Monster, the conventional explanation, the conventional way that we think about it is there probably is a real live animal at the bottom of that. The fact that now many of us that are interested in this subject tend not to think that. Uh, let me just add this caveat, of course, which is that when you say you're interested in cryptozoology or you're a cryptozoologist, people always say, oh, you're like a Nessie believer or a Bigfoot believer. Some of us are. But a lot of us are interested in it because we're fascinated by the socio-cultural side of it, the anthropological side of it. It's like even if there's no real animal at the bottom of many of these reports, many of these stories, and and and, and that's my personal opinion, I often don't think there's a real animal at the bottom of it. It's still a fascinating phenomenon that is definitely worthy of study. And in, and in often, often cases, we haven't done that much study of why people do believe this, believe in this thing. Something like Bigfoot is like it's massive in popular culture massive there's almost like no escape from it today and it's like why is that belief so embedded even if there is no bigfoot out there there's no like large undiscovered north american primate there's still a phenomenon worthy of study there and if that's the case this isn't really something that's actually about zoology it is a little bit but it's about something else and and what is it you know cultural like i said cultural anthropology sociology anthropology it's uh yeah so that's a bit of a messy answer, but that's kind of where I think we're at with cryptozoology today. Okay, well, I want to talk to you, I mean, I guess around several different strands. I mean, Bigfoot, <laughs> I want to talk about specifically a bit later. I want to talk start this conversation with 
paleontology with the idea that millions of years ago, this whole world, the whole landscape was totally different. And there were these big creatures stomping around, eating each other and what have you. Um, why is it that to this day, you have stories of the, what's that? I can't remember the name of the uh, the massive octopus in the uh, in the sea, but it's supposed to exist. Um, there's a, I think that's prehistoric. And also- the, You mean, I'm sorry, Kraken? Is that what you're thinking of, that kind of thing? About Kraken, I'm thinking about- the dinosaur that's supposed to be hanging out in the Congo. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the Loch Ness Monster. And also going back to what you said earlier about being a cryptozoologist, when I first started speaking to you about this particular in conservation move, I was thinking, oh, great, I've got someone who's going to back me up and say, yeah, <laughs> of course they exist. And when you said, well, actually, I don't think most of them do, I was like, oh, really? But anyway, um, dinosaurs. Is there, is there by any chance, I know birds are dinosaurs, but is there by any chance, do you think the possibility that somewhere, like in a Congo, some remote place, there could be a brontosaurus hanging out? <laughs> um, a yeah, lot, lot to respond to there, but um, short answer is no. <laughs> the, 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 although having said that, as a scientist, you know, we don't exclude you know, so, there's so many exciting possibilities where further research is needed. There's more work. There's more work to be done. But the way I think about these things is you kind of have to flip it on its head, which is why do we why did we ever think that in the first place? What, where does this idea come from for all of these creatures? Where does the idea come from that they might be a reality? And in the case of the the living dinosaur trope, and thank you for the for the the nod to the dinosaurs are not extinct. Birds are dinosaurs, but excluding birds where does this notion come from that there might be things like yeah brontosaurs in the congo or whatnot well um a lot of work has actually been done on this and again it's something that reinforces what i said a moment ago about a lot of cryptozoological stuff being more akin to cultural anthropology or or something along those lines people were bowled over when we first started discovering um you know, giant extinct reptiles. With that, that's the thing that kind of really started in the 1820s and it you know, became more of a big thing throughout the 1800s. And one of the things that really took off was people, you know, imagining these animals as if they were still alive. You know, what would it actually be like to witness that the Charles Dickens refers to like, what would it be like to see a megalosaurus wandering up? You know, he's talking about some specific head in London. I can't remember which one. What would it be like to see, to see that? And, um, a lot of stories were written about it, a lot of adventure stories in the late 1800s, early 1900s. At That's kind of the same time at which you have this um, kind of colonial narrative, Europeans going to places like the, you know, or, or think, think of what people used to say about places like the Congo. They used to say it was this like dark, undiscovered land where the people there were sort of still Stone Age and there might be undiscovered like giant animals from prehistory there. I think add all these things together, that's the genesis of the idea that could there still be dinosaurs in the Congo? Could there still be uh, living plesiosaurs living in the you know obscure seas of the world and possibly even in certain lakes? That idea is established like relatively early on in our scientific discovery of the past. And that then forms the basis for a, a series of, of ideas that kind of become taken, you know, are taken more and more seriously by people that encounter these stories and, and don't know that they kind of started out as sort of half serious or even fictional. So the Brontosaurus in the Congo trope, I'm I'm really confident that it sort of starts out as as a as a mix of, yeah, sort of a kind of like fictionalized rom rom romance about what you know exotic parts of the world might be like a little bit of colonial racism because it is it's deliberately um framing parts of the world like like um, the congo as uh you know sort of out of date backwaters you know like places where civilization hasn't happened which, which today we know you know that, like the history of africa is so hugely complicated and and Europeans did so much to uh, kind of like cover up like how advanced some African nations were. Um, combine those things. That is that's the origin of some of these stories, and that continues today because you still have people saying that you can go to you can go to places like New Guinea and and tribal hill people there that you know haven't seen a white man before 
might still have stories about creatures that still exist in in the in the deep forest and maybe living living pterosaurs there's an alleged living pterodactyl type creature called the ropen which is supposed to be on new guinea so um i think that that actually answers like part of this question the what i'll say one final thing on this which is that um another reason for uh, the, the, the root of these stories is that when europeans went to you know parts of the parts of tropical africa that europeans didn't know well they heard stories from local people and they took that as as some kind of reinforcement of this expectation that such animals might exist the problem is today if you actually want to try and find out like i want to know more about you know like congolese monster myths tell me more about what the creature was supposed to look like and you know what people thought you know about his natural history and stuff and there's almost nothing there because we're at the point now where we've lost that knowledge it would have been centuries old even you know at the time that europeans encountered it and today of course if you go to brazzaville in the congo or whatever the people there are fully familiar with our concepts of makila mabembi and they repeating that back to people that are coming from afar because they know that's what they want to hear wow what about closer to home with the Loch Ness? I mean, I struggle to believe that even from, well, not from day one, because I wasn't there in day one, but when I first heard about it, <clears throat> I saw those grainy pictures from the 1920s of something out of the water with, you know, its head like that. Um, every year, it seems like every year people go with their submarines and submersibles looking for this creature and echo location, all that sort of stuff. There's obviously nothing there. What keeps that myth going? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I, I've been to Loch Ness loads of times, and uh, um, I, I absolutely love the sort of, you know, the the romance and intrigue of this amazing history of all these people that went to Loch Ness. Uh, s some of them were complete charlatans and hucksters, and, uh, and others were, you know, genuinely believed that we were, you know, years or even months away from discovering a valid new species of giant animal in the loch. But... Um, yeah, again, what, what's the origin of this idea? So we know that for you know the whole of the whole of history, people in Scotland have always had stories about kind of water monsters that might live in that part of the world. They call them um I shouldn't have said that because I can't remember what they called them. Kelpies, <laughs> Kelpie the water horse, which is this uh yeah, sort of semi-mythical predatory horse uh type creature. So you've kind of got an existing sort of mythology about some weird creature. And at some point, early 20th century, some canny journalists um, start exploiting this, particularly in the 1930s. So the, the Loch Ness Monster story really kicks off in the 1930s uh, when a local journalist actually starts saying that people here are seeing, are seeing a weird creature. Again, you've got to think of this in terms of what's going on you know, in terms of like broader history at the time. And in fact, quite a few really strange and very interesting ideas kicked off in the 1930s. And that might not be a coincidence. It might be due to the Great Depression, due to, you know, some events in Europe that ended up having quite a continental Europe that had quite a, a global impact. It could be, or well, not could be, we think it was, journalists were deliberately looking for kind of harmless, upbeat, kind of fun stories that um, you could write about in a newspaper and uh, they would just be it's sort of like your and finally type story or your sort of page five story. It's kind of like it's a bit of fun. It might might or might not be true. There's not much effort in actually, you know, finding something to write about there. The Lo Loch Ness Monster becomes a phenomenon in the early 1930s, particularly 1933 and 1934. And uh yeah, there's kind of like a monster craze at that time. King Kong, the movie, comes out at the same time. It's it's actually a matter of some debate among Loch Ness monster scholars as to how important uh, the movie King Kong is with respect to the uh, Loch Ness monster sightings. Uh, it's probably it's probably been overstated, but it's part of like a general monster craze, and people at that time are then prepared to believe that the Loch Ness Monster is real, and that then becomes an entrenched idea that's still with us today. So today you've got this phenomenon called expectant attention, where Nessie is so familiar, so well-known, that if any of us go to Scotland, sorry, go to Loch Ness, you will have the idea of the Loch Ness Monster in your mind, and you'll be looking at Loch Ness, and you see something on the water, and 
if it was any other body of water, you might think, is that a grebe or is that a, a seal or a deer? But in Loch Ness, they go, is that Nessie? And I think that's hugely powerful. And um, yeah, it's 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 such an enduring myth. We're never going to shake it. Even today, when we're pretty confident there is no Loch Ness monster. So do you think people, I mean, lying would be maybe too much of a strong word. Do you think people are so desperate to, to kind of perpetrate this story that they would almost imagine seeing things. Yeah, yeah, I, I I totally would agree with that. And um I've tried increasingly in my own writings to say that um if you go through the list of people that claim to have seen a stick with the Loch Ness monster, the people that claim to have seen it, there are liars and hoaxes in there. There really there are. But the majority of people it's not. The majority of them it's expectant attention. It's seeing something and not being able to identify it very few of us are really that familiar with all the weird stuff that can happen on a big body of water Loch Ness is, is beyond the experience of most of us it's so strange you know it's like it's like 30 kilometers long and more than a kilometer wide and it's extremely deep I, I can't remember in meters how deep it is but it's deep and the behavior of water at the surface is odd and then there's a whole load of 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 animals and other objects that people see there that you've probably seen like I don't know, 90% of all the water birds in the world at this point in your life. But most people haven't seen a grebe. <laughs> they don't even know what it is. Most people don't know that, that deer swim across uh, Loch Ness and they've, they've been filmed doing this. Most people don't know that seals occur in Loch Ness. Very few of us have seen relatively large fish, as in, you know, like a sort of a salmon about a metre long, you know, come up to the surface. So people have all those experiences, unusual wave and wake effects, unusual animals. And and they they are they're thinking nessie they see something that's weird to them and that is their nessie so they're not lying they're they're kind of misreporting an encounter that they have had and if and again if there's something that you can say about cryptozoology we call the the creatures of cryptozoology we call them cryptids so a thing that again is kind of like quite a foundational concept in the 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 sightings of cryptids is it's people having experiences but misinterpreting them. And so that's not the same as it's all lies and hoaxes. It is experiences, but it's, um, yeah, how people understand, interpret, and then convey that experience. That's yeah. the tricky thing. And once it's conveyed, it then becomes Chinese whispers or becomes embellished, and then it becomes, you know, what the newspapers love. Yeah. Um, I learned an interesting fact about the Loch Ness Actually, apparently there's more water. There's more water in the Loch Ness Loch than there is fresh water in the whole of England or something. There's this amazing amount of water in there. Yeah, the whole of the UK. That sounds right. I mean, it's massive. Yeah. Um. Okay. So we kind of dispelled the Loch Ness monster. I'm <laughs> I'm happy with that. Now let's move on to things that could be more real. Now, Bigfoot, the fella behind me. I've had an interest in that phenomenon that whatever for for most of my life and when i uh bought a, an encyclopedia on, on cryptozoology about 10 years ago i read through it and lots of the stuff i read seemed fairly stupid but then when you kind of do more research you find find out that things like the mountain gorilla that we all know and love was only recently discovered in in in, in scientific terms i mean i think the early 1900s and similarly, the uh, Okapi, the the relation of the giraffe. I mean, that was a recent discovery too. And I don't know if I told you, but I I was on a ship once, and uh, a trip going to Antarctica, and I gave a talk um, about does Yeti exist? And actually, I had no internet, no nothing. I just did it off the top of my head. Um, but what I was trying to to kind of prove was the fact that we know nothing about anything i mean how can we tell anyone but it's not a yeti when we can't even we don't even know who's living next to us <laughs> we lose ourselves in cities you know we don't know how many you know we don't know how many whales there are in the sea i remember at the talk i gave most of the people came from canada and i was saying to the audience hands up those who live near a forest knowing full well that most of them did and they put their hands up i said how many people know every single tree in that forest and everyone puts their hands down so i basically said you know in the end of the day how can we say it doesn't exist and then you look at things like examples like the sumatran tiger 
which I was reading about, and the fact that that was thought to be extinct for a long period of time. People went out looking for it, never found not even a hair. And then one next day or whatever, recently, they found they're found to be there. And I'm thinking about the uh, the Bigfoot phenomenon. I've I've watched documentaries on Nat Geo, for example. Uh, with primatologists talking about the possibility of it existing and going out into the woods and saying, look, that could potentially be a nest that one's made and it could be uh, the direct ancestor or even the, um, I forgot the name of the ape that existed X amount of million years ago, big ape that could still be existing. Um, and the fact that they are super intelligent and they want to keep well away from us. So that's why we, we don't find anything. And then you watch these documentaries and these, uh, yeti hunters or whatever go out and they listen you hear in the background and they say that's it calling and you hear knocking and people go out in the woods and and you know with their recording equipment and they hear strange things and I've even met someone I met someone in in actually funnily enough in Canada who said that they didn't believe in yeti until they went to I think British Columbia in the west which apparently has the biggest or the most amount of yeti sightings anywhere in the world or sort of large ape sightings and he said he stayed in a forest overnight and he said it, it spooked him and he didn't believe in that but he felt that there was something there and he needed to get out of there so why is it that we as a, a human species whatever we have this 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 yeti thing in our history regarding I mean, regardless of where we are, whether it be in North America, whether it be in the Himalayas, whether it even be in Scotland, because you've got the old grey man that people have seen in the Cairngorms. Why is this this creature so similar around the world? Why, if it doesn't exist, surely there must be something that, that created that whole sort of thing in the first place. Surely there must be something that triggered that in in, in the history. You've given me like about three hours worth of conversation there, so I'll try and <laughs> I'll try and I'll try and be brief. Try and summarise it. So, um, yeah, of course, yeah. So Bigfoot is the name we use for the North American one. Yeti is the animal of a similar type, mostly associated with the Himalayas and surrounds. I'm a wannabe believer for those things. I really am, and I'm very uh, fortunate to have. Uh, I, I got to go to uh, Oregon. Um, uh, late 2021, I think, and actually uh, got to hang out with Cliff Barrackman, who's one of the uh, um, Finding Bigfoot guys from the TV show. And we went out into the woods and we did the like, looking for Bigfoot thing. Um, and it's it's very like if you if you've like you know read basically all the stuff you keep up saying I've got like I've got like two whole shelves in this office that are devoted just to books on on Bigfoot and, and similar creatures. There's a vast amount of research on them. It's kind of difficult to know where on the scale of like does not exist to exists and will be discovered. You know, like imminently, it's kind of sometimes hard to know where you should plot yourself on that position because I'm aware of basically all the arguments. I'm impressed sometimes by a number of qualified scientists who include people from all walks of life as in, in professional life, as in like, you know, they had sort of military tactical training. They were trained field ornithologists. They're like DNA experts, you know, they're sort of like field expert, field skills, field craft experts. There's people like that, um, including some who are trained in primatology and anthropology, people like that who say that the evidence that we have for Bigfoot is big enough that it should be taken seriously. They're referring to things like, you know, the evidence in the tracks is good enough, the evidence from these alleged nests, alleged um, damaged animal carcasses and damaged trees and the vocalizations that people have recorded. They're saying that is good enough. And they also say that some of the bits of film we've got, most famously the 1967 Patterson Gimlin film, they say that all of that stacks up and is consistent and they, there you go. We are talking about like a non-human hominid, a, a great ape of some kind that is awaiting discovery in North America. On the other hand, you know, like basically every bit of evidence that's been put forwards um, has been quite effectively countered in, in some way. Every every one of those bits of evidence, the debate about the Patterson film is like endless, it's back and forth, back and forth. You know, there's um, all, all the evidence from the tracks, the vocalizations, all the things I just mentioned all been countered and on a day when i'm skeptical i'm like yeah the, the evidence is not stacking up um 
the, the, the evidence for the Yeti, I, I won't I won't go into that in as much detail. The evidence for the Yeti, surprisingly, is almost non-existent. It's like there's there's hardly anything that's anywhere near as interesting as the alleged evidence put forwards for Bigfoot. Now, uh, I hate to sound like a you know, stuck record. I don't want to keep on saying this, but you have if you take this back into this kind of like cultural context again, where do where do these ideas come from? And we know that the concept of the modern concept that we have of of Bigfoot basically originates in the 1960s when a bunch of people in California start talking about finding giant human type footprints initially you know it was, that's where the name bigfoot comes from and then at some point there's this sighting where this guy actually in canada william rowe he was called he claims to observe one of these creatures and he gets his daughter to produce a nice a nice illustration of a female bigfoot and that is kind of like the cornerstone of where everything comes from everything comes from these two things the footprints uh, found in california and this uh, canadian uh, alleged eyewitness account and um yeah, that that's the sort of like cornerstone of like every everything everything that follows thereafter is trying to match that. The Patterson um, Gimlin footage, for example, that's an obviously female Bigfoot. Is it a coincidence that the only Bigfoot that existed, the image that existed before that, is the William Rowe obviously female Bigfoot? I'm not going to say why they're obviously female, but if you know the images, you'll know what I'm what I'm referring to. Um, then to my final my final point on this, just to broaden this out a bit more. You mentioned, David, the fact that, uh, yeah, people claim these sightings of these things all around the world. Well, this to me is 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 actually not a plus point. It's a, it's a it's a negative point. It's a problem because we mostly know from our own experience, from things that have happened to you during your life, that we automatically look for and find the human shape everywhere. Right. This is called pareidolia. We always like seeing figures, shapes of humans, like dark shapes in the forest. We interpret them as humans are. Uh, a bit of clothing in a room, you know, is often seen as a, as a, as a human shape. It's a very common thing. And I think that people in scary situations like, you know, remote woodlands or in the mountains or whatever, think they see human shaped things. And you've got to combine that with the fact that every culture on earth, and so far as we know, every culture on earth has the concept of a wild person. It might be a wild man, it might be a wild woman, but what wild people of some kind that bridge the gap between us and the, and the rest of nature. So people, I think, similar. this is a little bit similar to the expectant attention thing I said about Loch Ness. It's like people, all, you, you automatically go into the wilderness. You're not a blank slate. You automatically go into the wilderness with two things. The expectation that you'll see human-shaped things, because we're just programmed to do that, because we're human, and this idea that there must be wild people. Because like I say, we need something that connects us to the rest of the world. So I kind of think that those two things are crucial to the wild man phenomenon. So the fact that it's become quite, um, how do I describe it, sort of crystallized, it's been really firmed up in North America for a bunch of cultural reasons, um, is, is part of a global phenomenon. When I hear people, and this is an increasingly common thing today, when I hear people talking about seeing Bigfoot in England and Ireland and Scotland and Spain and Romania, this is this is an increasing thing. It's like that's not good because while all of us might be, you know, uh, as, as you've just said, you you can well believe there could be a large undiscovered animal in like the Yukon or Alaska, like you know, we can all accept that, or even even Amazonia or Indonesia. I can't pretend there's one living five miles outside of Croydon, or um, <laughs> or or where you know Spain or what have you. Um, I think that this, yeah, this shows that this wild man archetype is almost like a fundamental bit of of human baggage. We take it everywhere with us. And while I would love it if Yeti and Bigfoot were real, it's like that's my main problem. It's like the the evidence for their yeah for their existence at the moment isn't as convincing as it should be if they're real. Okay, I mean. All right, there's a, a lot to unwrap there as well. Actually, in what you've said, um, I, I I I look back at that famous piece of uh, film that you talked about. Is it Patterson? Patterson uh, Gimlin film, yeah. Yeah, uh, and I wondered first of all, how come all the other pieces of film you can Google on on YouTube is all fuzzy and shaky, and you know I don't understand that. Number one, so that kind of makes me suspicious. But number two on the more positive side watching that documentary i saw on nat geo talking uh, there was i think four 
uh, primatologists and one one doubter scientist, and they were sort of examining examining that film, and they said that the the Bigfoot character <laughs> that walked across the frame um, was a female, as you said, or, or seemed to be a female. But then when they tried to reenact it. Apparently, when they actually said, right, let's go out in the field, let's get someone dressed up in a suit and see if they can stride like that creature did. It was impossible because it was actually physiologically different to a human. And the other thing that was was striking about it all was the fact that they said at the time, which was in 1967, the technology was not there to build a, 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 an ape suit or monkey suit, call it what you want that sophisticated, you know, because I remember the Tarzan films and they all look pretty kind of, uh, you know, pretty shaky and shady. So how 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 do you explain that? Or how can you, um, you said that some of those were, some of those points were actually um, agreed with, I suppose, by other scientists. What were their agreements? How were how they kind of saying it, it was real? And also the calls, how did they explain that? I mean, the, the doubters as well as the people that are convinced there's something out there how do they explain mm. that so it, it sounds to me like you're talking about the documentary bigfoot legend meets science which um stars jeff meldrum uh quite a lot jeff meldrum's a uh professional technically qualified primatologist based at idaho state university and he's one of a few researchers who have argued because because all those points that you've made they're they're familiar if you know the Bigfoot literature, it's been argued that, um, yes, the, the gait, the, specifically how Patty, the, the animal in the, the alleged animal in the Patterson Gimlin film, exactly how it walks, can't be replicated by a human. And it's girth and mass and height and stuff doesn't match uh, with a human. And I, I'm aware of the arguments and they, they have, there's, a, there's an argument and a counter argument to all of them. So Patty is supposed to walk in a specific kind of, to use what's called a compliant gait, which is where you walk with permanently bent knees, you you lift your feet up quite high, you walk with your torso leaning forwards, and it's been argued that humans can't do that, and it's been argued that she is also you know beyond a uh, human frame in terms of like you know like I say girth, mass, and so on. None of those things are true, so humans can uh, replicate a compliant gait. They have done so very effectively, and it turns out that all these arguments about patty being beyond the range of our species that's 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 not true either it turns out she's actually much shorter than than people had thought back in the 60s we've got like you know using um uh, uh people have been able to stabilize they've been able to stabilize the film and produce you know like d discover a lot more a lot more detail in it the the suit is under the suit i shouldn't have said that the creature in the footage is undeniably it looks great i think it looks really good I, and i i don't accept it when people say oh you can see straight away it's a hoax and no you can't it's actually really well done and there's a couple of key points to make on that one of them is if roger patterson was the maker of said suit he's not just some like random cowboy dude out in the woods who just, you know, films Bigfoot. So uh, a really important part of the story for me is Patterson at this time in his life, he died very young, uh, I, th I think in his late thirties, uh, he was devoting all of his time to making, to basically making money out of Bigfoot. And in 1966, he published a book on Bigfoot called Do Abominable Snowmen of North America Really Exist? And in that book, there's a uh, illustration of the William Rowe encounter, which is the one I mentioned earlier, the guy in Canada who says he's, he's a female Bigfoot. And it's a mirror image of the Patterson footage. It's an obviously female Bigfoot striding across a clearing, walking with a compliant gait, being watched by the guy with a gun. And it's like, it seems a very peculiar coincidence that you did an illustration in 66 that you then actually sort of filmed in 67. That's a bit of a problem. And in terms of, oh, and, and Patterson also was an amazing like craftsman and artist. Again, it's, this isn't just some random guy. If, if it's a, if it's a fake, they don't just, they don't just like, you know, chuck to first skin on someone. They, they've gone to a lot of trouble to make it look good. It does look good. Does it look better than, uh, I'm worried there's too much to say here, so I'll try and stop in a moment. Mm. Um, I, I, I basically think that that they were extraordinarily lucky 
in terms of the circumstances of photography on that day because the main thing to me that that makes the the, the patty object whatever it is the thing that makes it look good is stuff like the sheen on the fur what looks like actual you know sort of the movement of muscles and so on that happens because of the the gloss the way the sort of light is hitting it which is something that none of us can control in the outdoors i think they were extraordinarily lucky and people have made suits that i would argue are just as good there's a whole book written uh, I can see it across the room from here. It's called When Roger Met Patty, a whole book written on the fact that you can't fake this suit, right? That was the that was the argument. And it's like, well, people have done actually a really good job, but they didn't have the same circumstances of photography. They didn't have the same, you know, quirks of lighting that make the Patterson creature look really good. And I'm bothered by the fact that when she turns, you actually see like a skirt or hem around the waist, like move in a way that does not, does not look realistic. So it's not, it's not flawless. So I would absolutely, I really want Bigfoot to be real. I so do. But um, the Patterson footage has got these issues connected to it that I'm just like at the moment. Yeah. It's, it's not a piece of evidence that we can put forward and say, there's no way a person could do this. They absolutely could. People can replicate the gate. People are, are the same size. There's a long toing and froing over. If if we actually know the guy in the suit, it's been argued that we've actually identified the guy in the suit. God called Bob Hieronymus. So there's a whole book written about that. So um, yeah, it's like every single one of the points that you can mention on Bigfoot. Oh my God, there's like literally whole books been written about it. It's been done to death. So <laughs> well, I'm shattered sorry my illusions are shattered i mean i for those who haven't seen that piece of film google it it's really interesting because there's one time when the thing's walking across the frame and, and he actually just looks at the camera and then carries on walking which i found a bit weird actually when i first saw that but one more thing on bigfoot what about all the shrieking and the shouting at night what's that then yeah the vocalizations um Quite a few of these haven't yet been explained and quite a few of them do seem to, um, uh, yeah, they, they involve noises that can't be replicated by by humans. This is the, the main argument. The counter argument, because there's counter arguments to all these things, is have people properly checked all of the possibilities that might, you know, explain it? So there's a whole list of other, other animals that might make noises in the woods of North America. Um, they they include you know animals like familiar animals like cattle but also various deer puma um yeah could they actually explain uh, some of the stuff now I, i've got to say that some of the noises that i've heard not in, i have heard un, unexplained or inexplicable sounds in in, in north america but um uh, some of the best noises that i've heard on online i'm like that's very strange i don't really know i don't really know what that is i can't i can't be explained it doesn't match with anything that, that i can think it might be no, ma no matter what you what you say people come up with this list of things um so, so yeah i'm not i'm not prepared to like utterly dismiss all of this stuff but um that that alone is not a, a sufficient evidence for us to accept that that is legit evidence for for bigfoot so uh the the doors the doors open still i think but um you know we we need much better evidence than what we've got at the moment okay let's move on to something which possibly could be more well could be more possible and that is some of the wildlife that we had very recently that's now gone um we were talking prior to pressing the record button about the passenger pigeon as a kid I was really upset to learn that they had been killed before I even had a chance to see one. Uh, similarly with things like Eskimo Curly, which may or may not be extinct. Um, I really do believe that some of those creatures are still existing. I really do think that maybe there might be a tract of forest or some undiscovered area or un underwatched area where some of these animals exist. Um, you told me something which I just couldn't uh, believe, and that was with the passenger pigeon. I thought that the last one was Martha that died in 1913 in Cincinnati Zoo, and then that was that. I also thought that being a creature that loved hanging out in big flocks, once the, the flock diminished to a certain, you know, beyond a certain size, it, they just died out. But you've been telling me that there's been uh, possible reports of 
of of passenger pigeons since. Mm. Yeah, so f- for all of the um, all of the sort of like famous, you know, classic recently extinct birds, um, there are post extinction sightings, alleged sightings. Now, on the one hand, you, you you think that it's actually really hard to pin down an extinction date, you know, even to a specific year, because, you know, think of the range, the geographical range of a species like the pasture pigeon. Are people out there monitoring all the places where it might occur, you know, 365 days of the year? Well, obviously not. And there's there's got to be some point when the species is down to I don't know, like 50 individuals. So when are you absolutely sure that all those all those 50 are gone? I would say that to start with. So so for uh, people have used various statistical tests to um, chart what we understand about the populations of these animals and then say uh, this, this has been done most recently for the thylacine, you know, the, the Tasmanian wolf. It's like we're not absolutely sure when they went extinct. We know the last one died. The last one in captivity died in 1936. But are we prepared to say that the species as a whole went extinct in 1936? It's like we can't say for sure. But the statistics of like, you know, when we knew they were around means that they could have persisted for a couple of decades after that. They could have hung on to say, let's say, for example, the 1950s. So for a bird, if a pass, if passenger pigeons, if the last one dies in captivity in 1913 or 14, um, could there still be wild individuals like in the 20s? I would say that, yes, I would say that's that's quite still scientifically plausible. And it's maybe therefore consistent with that that there are claimed sightings of wild passenger pigeons seen in various parts of the US and Michigan is a is a place where people claim to have seen them into the 20s and 30s what's more surprising is there's this claimed sighting from 1965 which was made in oh it was made it was made by people that were traveling between Florida and Indianapolis or something i can't remember where it's meant to have happened but um yeah could a small group of these birds persisted um that 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 late i mean uh, that seems a bit of a stretch to me but i wouldn't rule it out entirely and i would also uh you know say that um you know the bird life of, of north america the number of birders that are doing a pretty good job of recording even you know the most obscure vagrants and so on does imply that that's that's unlikely it's unlikely that people would um you know overlook uh, a species like that and one final point on this and this this is sorry there's a negative point I'm not, I'm not i'm no longer reinforcing what like i was a minute ago um a lot of these accounts of strange creatures whether that's bigfoot type stuff or whether that's like alleged late surviving great orcs or passenger pigeons or whatnot they generally are written about by people who make their living from writing about weird stuff. And they're often like deliberately, you know, deliberately accruing weird little accounts in newspapers and things. And um, I think sometimes we have to remember that those kinds of accounts are so like a little snippet about, you know, man sees passenger pigeon in Florida does not have the same uh how do i how do i say it? you know it's, it maybe doesn't have the same value scientifically as does for example you know like a, a technical report in you know you, you name a technical bird bird observers journal kind of thing you know what i'm saying so um yeah it's, it's it is nonetheless interesting that for all these animals they very likely did persist beyond their air quotes official extinction date and in some cases, that might have been by a couple of years, a couple of decades, rather. And do they still persist today? Uh, you you will have seen the massive amount of hoo-ha about the claimed persistence of the ivory bill woodpecker. I mean, that's that's kind of like a huge discussion that's never that's never going away. And uh, there's there's people that are so convinced by again observations they have had. They're they're saying that we still must hold out hope that this species does does persist, and we just need to confirm it. But surely those species that can't be that hard to I mean they're obviously hard to find, but surely with all those people looking over all those decades, something must have been found. And why is it always a fuzzy picture? 
I thought you were meant to be putting the case for the existence of these creatures. No, <laughs> well, that, 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 that again, that's a big part of the argument. It's like for all of these things, they've now been searched for so much. We're not, sadly, we're not in a world where the amount of wilderness is increasing, are we? <laughs> it's often, often the opposite. So, uh, yeah, I mean, even even for the parts of North America, people say that there, there just isn't space for something like Bigfoot. Um, yeah, to exist, and 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 the, the case for the ivory billed woodpecker, or claimed persistence of great orcs in the North Atlantic, or or various other examples you could think of. It's like those places are now so explored, so often, you know, visited by people, so degraded ecologically that um. Yeah, again, are we dealing with something that's more akin to kind of like a sort of cultural archetype than uh, than like a, a, a possible zoological reality? I mean, yeah. A cultural fantasy, collective fantasy. Yeah. Going back to the thylacine, or is it the um, Tasmanian wolf? I mean, I've seen stuff online. People, some lady took a, a video of a creature she saw bounding across the plains in, in, in Australia, and it looked like a, a thylacine to me. Um and that was not that long ago, maybe 15 years ago. What is the scientific view on that? Do people um, think to themselves, oh, it must exist, or it's only going to exist if I see it and I shoot it and get it or, you know, catch it or whatever? H how does it become reality, in other words? How does a species that's been a, a cryptic species suddenly become reality? Yeah, well, I guess... You would have to think what level of evidence would be convincing to any one of us, particularly if you're using quite high standards. So um, something like, you know, getting a piece of footage of something. The, the problem with the thylacine, of course, is it's dog shaped it, uh, in the broader sense the the canid family. And uh, virtually all of the thylacine, persisting thylacine evidence has been put forwards within the last several decades, virtually all of it pertains to foxes. Now, we know that thylacines were present in mainland Australia, certainly until a few thousand years ago, maybe something like you know, three or four thousand years ago. There's no doubt about that at all. We've got mummified ones and fossils of them and everything. Um, and yet the number of sightings, air quotes, sightings, the number of claimed sightings of thylacines on the Australian mainland is is high it's in the thousands it it way outnumbers the number of claim sightings from the island state of tasmania which of course the one place where we we know that thylacines persisted until you know historic times they were like, like i said they were definitely still there in the in the 30s um so i am not aware of any really good evidence for the persistence of thylacines into into modern times the statistical tests i mentioned earlier where people have looked at populations over time and what that might mean for extinction dates means that i'm prepared to think it, it fairly likely that they 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 were still present in tasmania until the the 1940s possibly to the 50s possibly to the 60s at that time, of course, people didn't know they were definitely extinct. They were still thinking that they were really, really rare, just just hanging on. But none of the evidence has been put forwards for their persistence. That that's the key take home. It's like what evidence can you put forward to convince, you know, people with high standards, which which includes the scientists who have to make, you know, hardline decisions on uh, conservation and whatnot. You know, what evidence like convinces us that that they're real? And at the moment, there, there certainly isn't anything like that for thylacines, sadly. So what cryptid do you think exists? Yeah, I get asked this quite a lot, often because I seem to be framing things <laughs> with a negative take, which is which is not my, not, don't, don't make a complete misery guts about it. But um, there's a few things where I think that in some of the places, the areas are still wild enough. And uh, I quite like it when not only is there a sort of indigenous like knowledge or belief in the persistence but the people who seem to know for sure what they're talking about loads of experience will come back from this place and say i did actually see one i think one i think they're legit and um really high on that list near the top is the orang pendek of sumatra which is yet another alleged mystery hominid so a human-like great ape it's supposed to be you know about four foot tall red shaggy fur live in the forest probably be a it's probably a good climber as well as a bipedal walker probably related to orangutans and there's a number of highly qualified 
primatologists who have uh, uh, and and people qualified in in mammalogy, not just in primates, who've you know uh, had uh, had encounters, well claimed encounters, sightings of it, seen footprints of it. Um, I quite like the fact that John McKinnon, who's famously associated with the discovery of the Sayola, this uh, unusual uh, relative of antelope from um, um, Laos. Um, yeah, he, uh, I, I, th I think I'm remembering correctly that he saw a footprint of what he could only explain as orang pendek. So that's a good example. And then there's a bunch of other animals that I'm pretty sure await discovery in the seas. And that's a whole nother subject that we can't touch on today because it's just too much to say. But um, uh, I, 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 I do hope that many of these creatures exist. It's just, you know, you've got to have absolutely compelling evidence. And that is our problem for so many of them. What is your favorite uh, fantasy cryptid? <laughs> uh, that, I, I, that depends on what day I'm asked. And uh, I quite like a lot of the, uh, the various sea monsters that have been theorized to exist by the people who've written about them. I'm a big fan of Mothman. Are you familiar with Mothman, David? <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, I, I do really like Bigfoot, though, because one of the reasons I like it is not just because it's kind of like a cool, scary concept, but because this is one of those creatures where, you know, imagine we're in a world where it is, dis where it is you know, discovered to be real what implications would that have for like you name it it's kind of like in terms of in terms of um what what it means for the discovery of large animals in general it would like oh my god if we've discovered that then it means this and this and this and this, and this. in terms of what it means for our place in relation to the natural world the the favorite hypothesis among bigfoot truthers bigfoot advocates the favorite hypothesis is that it's a a paranthropine it's part of this you mentioned gigantopithecus the giant ape from east asia that's not a favored hypothesis at the moment it's the idea that it's um one of these kind of like proto-human type creatures that are known from the fossil record of um eastern and southern africa uh the idea is that those animals paranthropus it's a, it's a heavy bodied herbivore with giant chewing muscles and big teeth the idea is that got into asia and from asia got into north america so that would be closer to us, way closer to us than the other great apes, uh, gorillas and chimps and whatnot. And and therefore that would have major implications for like, you know, our relationship to the rest of the natural world, how we think about the natural world. And it would finally have massive economic implications in terms of like land management and who can do forestry and uh, how people use use the land, you you would think. So, so yeah, I think Bigfoot's fantastic idea for those for those reasons and others okay and if you could be anywhere on this planet where would you be right now uh it's pretty crappy weather here today so i'm gonna go cuba <laughs> <laughs> oh but i, I want uh, like uh, the the south american tropics ecuador colombia i want to i want to do what you do i want to go see in loads of cool birds <laughs> <laughs> okay well um Thank you, Darren. Before you go, I just want to quickly tell all the uh, the Zoomers out there, but we've got some great conversations coming up before Christmas, um, including uh, speaking with a lady that's in the uh, Zoom room now, Gina, Gina Nichols, who's going to be talking about running nature tours in the US. I'm looking forward to that. And that's only in a couple of days' time. Next Monday on uh, December the 7th, um, sorry, December the 18th even, because I'm going back in time now, December the 18th, um, I've got a really exciting conversation lined up with a guy called Ken Kaufman, who is one of the gods of birding ornithology in, in North America. Um, I'm really so delighted that he agreed to come on because uh, in America, the American Ornithological Society, the AOS, I think it's called, um, have decided in their wisdom to change all the names of the birds that have been named after people and now will be named more descriptively. And that's caused ructions in some quarters. Um, so we're going to have a discussion as to why that's coming to be. So, I mean, there's loads of stuff coming up. Keep an eye on the Urban Bird World um, in conservation with list of who's coming up. Get involved. Um, please like and subscribe. And if you become a member of the Urban Bird World community, you can see what's coming next, which is going to be the Q&A, which I'm really excited about. But if you're not a member, this is where we say goodbye. So, Darren, thanks very much for coming today. And it's been 
totally and utterly fascinated. I've been heartbroken a few times. I've held it down, but it's been interesting talking to you. It's been great. Thanks very much for having me. Real pleasure to talk to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And Zoomers, thank you very much again for supporting In Conservation With. Um, hope to see you real soon, i.e. tomorrow. So until we meet again, keep looking up. <laughs>